Hey you all, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I am outside of the National Museum of American History. It's one of the greatest collections of American history. There's so many cool artifacts in here. Let's go check this out. First off, the Batmobile from the 1989 Batman movie. They have some pop culture artifacts spread around the museum because while I was here, the actual pop culture exhibit was closed, so I did get to see a little bit of it. Howdy Doody and Mickey Mouse merch. A creepy 1960s Mr. Doobie costume from the Romper Room and Early Kids TV show. I think that is the original Grover created by Jim Henson in 1967 and Prairie Dawn from the 1990s. And this is great. Bill Nye the Science Guy's jacket from the TV show that I had to watch in school. And this is the John Bull locomotive. It is one of the earliest steam locomotives in the US, built in 1831, and it was used on the first rail link between New York City and Philadelphia. And a 1842 hand pump fire engine used in Wilmington, Delaware. The Henry magnet was developed by Joseph Henry and electromagnets turned out to be a main use of electricity in the early 19th century. The museum has a very extensive collection of Edison inventions and artifacts. These are early carbon filament experiment parts. This is one of the original successful light bulbs used at a Christmas work demonstration in 1879. They also have a bunch of his notebooks. Edison's laboratory was very organized and ran like an invention factory. After the successful invention and patent secured, Edison began to construct electric generating stations in major cities. Of course, there was the direct and alternating current argument. This was an early AC current generator, which won out in the end. Plenty of historic meters and generators. Here are early fans, Edison was involved with that. Certainly one of the greatest inventions ever. They also have a few late 19th and early 20th century electrical engines. Now on to transportation. And this is a 1948 sedan, promoted as the first completely new car in 50 years because of the rear mounted engine. It didn't go well. Vintage neon sign. A 1959 Chicago rapid rail car. It was used on the Ellen subway for 30 years. 1955 Ford Country Squire Station Wagon. 1939 school bus used in Martinsburg, Indiana, a town that hardly exists. Here's some roadside history, a camper, an old cabin and neon sign. Route 66 gets recognition here, a classic U.S. highway that went from Chicago to Santa Monica. One day, hopefully soon, I'm doing it. This is a piece of automotive history. The first car to drive across the continent in 1903 by H. Nelson Jackson and Sewell K. Crocker. They also brought Jackson's dog, Bud. He didn't like the dust in his eyes, so he got goggles, and these are the goggles worn by the first dog to travel cross country. 
Before the automobile, railways were critical and most small towns had a station. An old streetcar used in St. Louis, it was used between 1898 and 1913. The Jupiter steam locomotive, built in 1876 and used in Northern California. The first major road was the National Road, which began construction in 1811 and went from Cumberland, Maryland to Vandalia, Illinois. This is an original marker. Here's the nautical exhibit. Ships were the original mode of transportation. It's always been important for industries like whaling. They mainly have a lot of cool model ships. That's a big ship engine. This is Julia Child's Kitchen. She had a very popular cooking show, wrote a lot of popular cooking books, and it contains the tools and equipment she used from the late 1940s to 2001. To summarize an exhibit on the history of food in America, basically we got into mass production and GMOs, high fat foods, and now we're the most fat country. Here's a little exhibit on money throughout American history. These are some forms of currency in colonial America. Some 19th century currency. And 20th century currency, some of it we use today. This is the workshop of Ralph Baer, who invented the first video game. At this desk setup, he worked on dozens of different inventions, including video games, electronic toys, talking books, and talking tools. This is a numismatic gallery, another exhibit on money and currency. Gold coins from around the world. That giant stone ring was money in the Pacific island of Yap, even though it weighs 168 pounds. The museum even has an exhibit on the history of American botany. Sorry, no, that looks exciting, but I'm gonna skip that. A Waterloo Boy tractor, built in 1918. Now into the American Enterprise exhibit, starting with the colonial times and the merchant era. This is a super creepy Edison talking doll which he manufactured as a toy phonograph in 1890. It wasn't successful, people didn't like it, wonder why. And this is the bulb Edison used at his first public demonstration at Menlo Park on New Year's Eve 1879. A single pole magneto telephone exhibited by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. A 1920s Fordson tractor produced by Henry Ford. a vintage TV set, and a sign used in Sesame Street in 1979. And that is Howdy Doody. There were three Howdy Doodies made, and this one was made in 1949. One American trend that has taken over much of the world now is fast food and franchising. Here's KFC, which I do have to say is one of the best. Many of our crappy restaurants like McDonald's have become popular in other nations. And this is the technology exhibit. And that is an Apple Macintosh from 1984. 
This is Many Voices, One Nation, an exhibit about immigration which has been so integral to the nation's history. Some very early Spanish artifacts, they were the first European settlers in what is now the US and Spanish New Mexico. An iron conquistador helmet. There was also New France. The French were mainly in the Quebec area, but also some areas in the northern US. And the British founded the 13 colonies on the east coast. This has artifacts from British South Carolina, an area where slavery became prevalent. There's good old Uncle Sam. After the revolution, many more diverse groups began coming in from across Europe, the Americas, and Asia. And of course the Native Americans were already here. An old neon sign in Spanish, probably for a Mexican immigrant population, very neat. This was used in a protest. She is shown holding a basket of tomatoes to represent agricultural laborers who often get screwed over, exploited, and underpaid. This is the Toga George Washington statue. It was commissioned by Congress and completed in 1842. After a long journey getting it here from Italy, it was in the rotunda of the US Capitol for a bit, but it was so scandalous it was transferred outside and then to the Smithsonian. This is the only presidential statue with nipples. This exhibit is within these walls, and that is an actual house built in the mid 18th century in Ipswich, Massachusetts, taken down and kind of reassembled here. The Choat family lived here in the 1760s, who were fairly wealthy at the time. Common objects that may have been used by the family. During the revolution, Patriot Abraham Dodge and his family, as well as their 14-year-old slave Chance, lived here. The Caldwells lived here in the mid-19th century, and they were middle class and reformers and abolitionists, and held meetings for abolition in their parlor. Then in the late 19th century, the house was old and unfashionable, and two Irish immigrant women, Catherine and Mary Lynch, lived here. Then during World War II, Mary Scott lived here, and she worked here in her victory garden and kitchen to aid in the war effort. And that is the pen President Lyndon Johnson used to sign the Fair Housing Act to protect people from seller and landlord discrimination. And one of my favorite exhibits here, American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith About U.S. Government. Here are some artifacts related to how European nations ruled and how their governments operated before the revolution. A copy of the Declaration of Independence. And that is the portable desk on which Thomas Jefferson wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence in June 1776. Jefferson even designed the desk. And that is George Washington's document box that he used to preserve papers in the Constitutional Convention. An original copy of Common Sense by Thomas Paine, one of the most effective arguments for American independence. This constitution was written by an anti-slavery society in Philadelphia in 1787 because they worried the constitution's fugitive slave clause already endangered free African Americans. An old printing press that Benjamin Franklin claimed he learned to print with while training in England. That is Toussaint Louverture's cane. He led the Haitian Revolution in 1791. Bunch of old political memorabilia. Some historic ballots. This is a log cabin parade prop for William Henry Harrison's campaign in 1840. By the way, he was born in a mansion and almost always lived in a mansion.
the pen used by President Lyndon Johnson to sign the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the overcoat of Reverend Hosea Williams, which he was wearing in the first Selma to Montgomery march. It was torn by Alabama state troopers when they attacked. Women had a long suffrage movement, only gaining the right to vote finally by the 19th Amendment in 1920. That is the table that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others used to sign the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. President Ulysses S. Grant signed the 15th Amendment using this pen. An incredible collection of political memorabilia here. That is the chair John F. Kennedy sat in during the first televised debate with Richard Nixon. Norman Rockwell's paintings of the four essential human freedoms that he did for the U.S. government during World War II. The inkstand used by President Abraham Lincoln to write the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. An original poster of Martin Luther King Jr. after his assassination. That is the Great Historical Clock of America. Built in 1890, which animated American history, had a procession of all presidents from Washington to Benjamin Harrison. I would love to see this thing work. An Uncle Sam outfit and Mount Vernon model. A game about American government called Lobby. Too real. That is Susan B. Anthony's iconic silk shawl. Behind that wall is the actual Star Spangled Banner, the flag that flew over Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor, which survived a British siege in 1814 and inspired Francis Scott Key to write the poem that would become the national anthem. They don't allow photos of it, and it's closely monitored, but that's not gonna stop me. I don't need to follow their stupid rules. Land of the free and home of the brave, right? Clara Barton's ambulance, used from 1898 to 1904 by the American Red Cross. This one was used to care for soldiers in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. This exhibit is called American Stories, and it's just another room here in this museum. Like first thing, Benjamin Franklin's freaking walking stick. A segment up Plymouth Rock where the Pilgrims landed in 1620. That rock became victim to souvenir hunters. A chemical flask of Joseph Priestley who discovered oxygen. Powder horn used in the French and Indian War. A tall case clock completed in 1769 by Joseph Ellicott, one of few clockmakers before the revolution. John Brown's Pike, used in the 1859 raid at Harper's Ferry. Also Joseph Emerson Brown's Pike. He supports secession. A bronze cast of Lincoln's Life Mask, produced by Augustus St. Gaudens, after Leonard Volk's original. A bell produced by Paul Revere in 1802. That is a stock ticker from 1900. An incandescent lamp by Edison General Electric, and Alexander Graham Bell's big box telephone from 1876. The only video recorder to capture the first plane hitting the World Trade Center on 9-11. I really like this. This is Jim Henson's Swedish Chef, used in The Muppet Show. He's one of my favorite Muppets. Archie and Edith Bunker's chair and table, and Archie's hat from All in the Family. And Muhammad Ali's autographed boxing gloves from 1974. There's plenty more in the museum, so make sure to watch part two. And thanks for watching.